Okay, let's begin with a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we invite your presence to be with us, to be our teacher and guide. We give thanks for the light you've been sharing with us, and the chronology of the Bible and sacred history. And we pray that uh, we can have understanding as to how to make applications there this year time of verse history before your return and may we be wise and, and um, able to discern your will for our lives and the delight to share to others in this with what we're about to study. We ask your blessing and presence with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Stephen, I'm just going to bring up one of your charts here. And um, and just ask you a few questions about it. And, and uh, so this was from our studies in the morning. And we had... And we'd looked at this in, in our Friday night study, I believe, too. So you're taking these two groups of seven years, and you're counting, counting the spans of time between, between them. So you're not start. So the 30 years is between uh, the birth of Joseph and, of course, when he stands before Pharaoh. Correct. Right? And mm -hmm. then the 50 years is going to be from the end of the famine until... Uh, they cross the Jordan. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it's going to be from that period of 14 years, the end of it, it's going to be 1,022 years to the beginning of the 2,300 years to 457. Correct. And, um, and then we're also going to have on the other end that 162 years, which was my suggestion that we go back there to Abraham leaving Haran because that's really the, where this starts. And then I compared that to Snow's first letter, which is on February 16th. And we can see we have a span of time representing a date on this end and a span of time representing a date on this end. Right? Correct. And the three, 30 years represent the three days between July 18th and midnight. And the two, 25 days line up with the 250 years. So it's consistent. So we can see that these are symbolizing Lee and Rachel's symbolizing July 18th. The plenty and the famine represents midnight and the conquer and the allotment of the land represents the midnight cry. And I think it's pretty profound that we can do this. Yeah, I think it's quite nice. You have the data. 16th of February, yeah. that was the 162 years. So that's the European way of writing the date. Yeah. Canadian. The, or is it Canadian as well? So at the other end, it's the American way. It would be October, it would be the month followed yeah. by the. So slight, sort of, uh, maybe you could say like a mirror. Almost. Yeah, I think of it as a mirror. Yeah. Now, then I was, I was looking at that 162 years, and, and I knew that 162 years ended up uh, showing up in the genealogy uh, after the flood. Right? Now, do you remember where that lines up? Just offhand. How many years, sorry? 162 years. One of the age of the patriarchs when they have a son. Do you remember which one it is? Is it uh, Jared? Yeah. He has Enoch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we have here listed uh, Jared, and then you're going to have Enoch. That's going to be the 65 years. Mm -hmm. And then 187 years to complete 252 years. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And um, so I think that's pretty significant there. So, so how would we, we take this? If we're going to take this 162 years, um, 
can we compare it to the 162 years that we have in your other chart? I haven't thought about it. Okay. Because 162 years is going to lead us to the start of this 252 year period that also has the July 18 symbolism. Mm -hmm. So them 162 years to the seven years where he works for Leah. Yeah. You can maybe symbolize them seven years being like a 2520. Yeah. And so. Um, yeah, so the 2520 is starting here, right? Is what we're saying. So that this... would be, yeah, that would be then the seven years then would take you to the birth of Lamech. So that would be the marriage. Yeah. Of uh, where he marries Leah and, Re Leah and Rachel, yes. And then, but it also, the 65 brings us to the 187, to July 18th. So this is a start of a period of, 252 years, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then this is the start of a period of 187 years, which both end together. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And... Um, well, you have the ending, yeah. So they both end when Lamek is born. Which is one eight. His name is one eight seven two zero. If you right assign numbers to his name, right, and that's going to symbolize the start of the seven hundred and seven seventy seven days, because it's going to be he lives for seven hundred and seventy seven years. Yes. Okay. Just so, another another thing I noticed from the sixteenth of February. Uh, yeah. to, to October 22nd is yeah. inclusive for the uh, 250 days. Okay, so 250 days from February 16th to October 22nd. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so then 25 days is like a tenth, like a tithe okay. within it. And yeah. uh, it's also... 6,000 hours is uh, 250 days. So I was just thinking maybe you have the, you know, we, we Mallory was had the 6,000 years ending on the 10th of, or sort of uh, 1843 or whatever at the time. So he had that idea of the 6,000 ending. Okay. So you have 6,000 hours there from Snow's letters. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, because 6,000 hours, that would be significant symbol, like 6,000 years. Or else it would be like 36,000 something minutes, whatever. <laughs> Yeah. There's, there's, there's three six o's there, three six o's there as well. You know, if you work it out and minutes of them, it's or seconds, you can go to two one six something, there's lots of zeros. So, yeah, it's, it's 36, 36,000 minutes. Sounds right, yeah. And then it's two million seconds. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, that's the symbol we get for the Sunday law. Right, the six times six times six is two mm -hmm. six. So, yes. yeah. So, so it gives evidence that October twenty second, eighteen forty four represents the Sunday law. Yeah, well, no major evidence, but you could uh, okay. yeah. you could add it anyway. I wouldn't use it as a main argument, but. <laughs> um, now, um, also, we had looked at the measurement of the statue in uh, just talking about last night. D did you have any thoughts on that in Daniel chapter 3? Yes. So you had uh, Ellen White's statement saying the statue was about 90 feet. Yeah. So she's going on an 18-inch cubit. Yeah. 
So in inches, that would be, as you noted, uh, 1,000 and nearly. Yeah. And uh, I did notice from when, so Nebuchadnezzar, he is the head of gold. Okay. So he, he becomes king in 605 BC. Yeah. So if you go 1,080 years from 605 BC, it will take you to 476, which is the end of Rome. Okay. Yeah, so that's interesting because one of the things we're doing there is tying to um, – um, so 1,080 minus 605. Yeah, so it brings us to 476 AD. And 476 AD is what we normally call the end of Rome, the Roman Empire, fall of Rome. And we have this connection between the 666 in Babylon and the 666 of Rome. Mm -hmm. Right, that Rome inherits this from Babylon. And, and we illustrate it in various ways. And, and then the symbolism here is the symbolism of 666, right? Because this is, if we multiply 60 cubits times 6, you get 360. Mm -hmm. and, and 360 is 36, which is a symbol of uh, 666. So the 360 is also connected to it. And I can't remember the other one we did. I think it was using the 21 inch cubit that gives us 1260, which still gives us some symbolism, even if it's not literally what happens with the, with the measurement. We can still symbolically represent it as 1260 in height. Mm -hmm. So you, you also pointed out that uh, 1080 is. Uh, what, uh, the number of helicum right. in an hour. In Hebrew so, hour. Yes. So you have that statue potentially symbolizing the hour that we find in Revelation 17, verse 12. That's my thinks, my thoughts. One hour with the beast. Yes, the ten kings. Yeah. Yeah, they have their... They, they have power, or they're kings, one hour with the beast. Okay. Now, what about the six-cubit base? Because, I mean, it says the breadth is six cubits, but we assume that it's it's a square base, six by six. Do we? Um, I think a lot of people do yeah. speculate. That it would would probably probably would be, I would say. Yeah, and and so that would be two thousand one hundred and sixty if we multiply it by sixty, by the height, by the the, va the base. So that would be sort of what you would call it. Yes. The, the the volume, though it's not representing the real volume, but in, in a sense measuring the volume. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so. So anyway, those are just a few things that I was wondering about. Um, so you can share your paper if you're ready to do that. I think we finished the uh, study concerning Ezekiel chapter four. Okay. Um, yeah, because we had looked at Ezekiel chapter four in quite a bit of detail. Yeah. There you go. There's your paper up. Okay. Now, was, can you see that? Yeah, Section I can see that. Yeah. Now, was there some loose ends that we still needed to pick up on that? I don't. Um, I don't think so. Okay. I think we pretty much covered it. Well, I think some of them we covered in our studies during the week. Some of the things I was thinking of. Okay. 
<clears throat> okay, so the last one took us down um, to the end of the Kings. Right. And uh, so, so now we're in the, the period of Judah and captivity mm -hmm. and the decrees of the Medo Persian kings. And uh, 585, we have Ezekiel prophesying the Valley of Dry Bones. And we have the Scapey that comes to him. We've Gog and Magog. Mm -hmm. And then um, the next year, then he prophesies a lament for Pharaoh, and he's made a watchman again. You know, so this is uh, we we talked about this. This is kind of like what's the point of being a watchman when the city's already it's too late. You know, the city's already gone. Yeah. You know, so what would be the point of him being a watchman again? I can't remember what we. Uh, Concluded from that. And then. Well, remember there, that's in chapter 33. And in right. chapter 33, it's a doubling of chapter 3. So chapter 3 is talking about being a watchman um, prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So um, I would think part of this that I would have is that this is is telling Ezekiel that his prophesying is referring to some future event uh, as well. Or a spiritual sense. Well, spiritual, but I would also say 70 AD. Okay. Right? Yeah. Because he was predicting the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD as well, even though he may be unaware of that. Okay, so that would be like 650. Fifty-four years or so. Yeah. After that, after this yeah, prophesying. 53. Yeah. 53, is it? Um, or is it? Because this is, because um, that's going to be in five um, yeah, yeah, six five three. I think you're right. Yeah. And, yeah. Six five. Let me think. Six five three, and then you got another another thirteen years to five ninety seven, which complete completes the six six six. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have. Uh, 582 then talks about in Jeremiah, the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, there's 745 Jews taken captive. Uh, where it mentions that in Jeremiah, there's actually 46, uh, 40, uh, 4,600 in total. I uh, think you mentions the seventh year and the 18th year as well. And, th and those are talking about different events. Yes. So they're not talking about the same thing. Yes, there, there are different periods where Nebuchadnezzar mm -hmm. make, takes captives from Jerusalem or Judea, Judea to um, Babylon. So there's three occasions. Yeah. And um, so and there's total of 4,600. So you have at on average then there's going to be 15.33 so far. So, um, also 1,533 Jews, basically on average, taken at each time. And then you have the seventh year and the 18th year, you have maybe like a symbol there of uh, July and 18. Oh, the seventh, the, seventh, the seventh year to the 18th year, you're saying? Well, there's three occasions when he takes captives. It's the seventh year, the 18th year, and the 23rd. Right. So maybe you could tie the 23rd year with the 2300. Yeah, 2300 days, yeah. Okay. Okay, so then we have Ezekiel's temple, which is uh, 19 years after he begins to prophesy. So it's... Uh, 
um, uh, metonic cycle. Yeah. Yeah, it's 19. Yeah. So, well, that's why it's uh, October 22nd, the 10th day of the seventh month in 573, mm -hmm. just as it is in 1844. And then in chapter one, verse one, it's the 21st day of the seventh month, July 27th, which is the fifth day of the fourth month. So it's the same, the same year in relationship to the Julian calendar in both of these as October, uh, as 1844 is to the Gregorian calendar. That I is, noted this, yes. April 4th is the first day of the first month. I mean, noted this was the uh, a Jubilee. Yeah, April 19th is the first day of the first month, I mean. Yeah, and this is a Jubilee, right? So we went through that Jubilee cycle. Then I noted Aaron's um, observation that it was 19 years, three months, and five days from his first vision, uh, which marked his 30th year. And you can get from that there the three months. You got 391.5. You can maybe have that symbolism. Okay. 391.5. So, so what you're saying is if you go from when he has his first vision on July 21st, uh, 592, uh -huh. and you go to October 22nd, 573, that mm -hmm. is going to be 19 years, three months, and five days. Yes. And that, that's using biblical months. Yes. Because um, the fifth day of the fourth month, the tenth day of the seventh month, is three months and five days, so we have 19 years. And so if you write, write that, it, it's got um, um, the 391 symbols, right? But, but in reverse. Yes. Right. Um, in, re in, re in reality, it would be about 19 years and 94 days. Yeah. I think we would kind of ask. Right. Yeah, 19 years and 94 days, which on the biblical calendar is three months and five days. But we could say it's five days, 19 years and three months. And that would be 391.5 in Good. reverse. Yes. Okay. Good. Okay. So, so, and that's interesting because it, we know that um, – that Ezekiel deals with this symbol of 391 and a half already, mm -hmm. right, from 977 to the destruction of Jerusalem. There, there is also the fact that it's, um, it, it's the 49th year, but it's also 14 years since the destruction of Jerusalem. Right, mm -hmm. is that what it says? Yeah, I think it's about the 14th year of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, well, no, in Ezekiel chapter, um, let me see, what does it say here? Or sorry, no, it wouldn't be, it would be there. No, so Ezekiel chapter 40, it's the five and 20th year of our captivity in the 14th year after the city was smitten. Okay, that's it, yes. So the 14th year means 13 years, mm -hmm. right? And And that symbolizes... 13 days, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. Is 18,720 minutes. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the 14th year, 13 years, is going to symbol symbolize that. So that's another way of looking at it. So that would be the 32nd year of Nebuchadnezzar. I take it then that occurs nine years after his 23rd. Yeah. Okay, so the next prophecy that uh, Nebuchadnezzar's to receive Egypt as wages for his service against Tyre. And there's an Ellen White quote. Yeah, that Daniel Fontenot brought up recently in his study about Tyre. Yeah. 
um, where Alan White says that Nebuchadnezzar takes Egypt and then Tyre. And this was, I was looking up, um, this was the date Taylor Bunch was writing about the seven years that uh, Nebuchadnezzar uh, is scattered. You know, the eagle's end, he's like a, an eagle feathers and whatever. He eats grass like an ox. So he has 570 as when he was given the warning. And then you have a 12 month period. I think from then. So um, five, nine. So that would be, yeah, five, six, nine, then you have seven years. It takes you to five, six, two. Yeah. This is, so that was his idea. I don't know. I, I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, based on the spirit of prophecy in my study of um, Belshazzar and his age and him seeing, because uh, he saw, she says, his condition. She saw um, that he saw the condition of his grandfather. Right, yes. He was alive at that time. Um, and also we know that uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to die in uh, at the end of that year of 562 BC, somewhere near the end. And that, um, so exactly when there's disagreements regarding that, we don't have any direct records but we do know that uh that that's the the accession year of evil Merodach ends in the spring of 561 because that's when he's going to release jehoiachin from prison mm -hmm. right on the 25th day of the 12th month and then have some kind of ceremony on the 27th day of the 12th month and um so since his accession year is there, we know Nebuchadnezzar dies in 562 or, or near the end of that year. Because 561 is, the, is then the coronation of evil Merodach. But it'll be early 561 when he dies? Um, the view is that he actually dies probably in December. Okay. Of... of, of a five six two so there's because you know evil meridak has an accession year mm -hmm. but um but i i'm not sure that sure that that's correct or not because it, it's kind of odd that he waits until december 25th not december 25th the 12th the 25th day of the 12th month so it's going to be in march to to release um the hoya chin but maybe there's reasons why he has to wait that you know we don't know about is just because nebuchadnezzar died doesn't mean that evil Merodach necessarily has control of babylon yet because who's going to succeed nebuchadnezzar isn't really quite clear that that evil Merodach is the clear successor and and he doesn't retain the throne for very long So like two years or something, isn't it? What's that? Two years, is it? Well, yeah, not really, but really more like a year. Right, okay. A year and a half or something like that. Yeah. Okay, so that's the, the, the logic you were talking about there for the first year of Belshazzar? Yeah, the, the share of the kingly throne, 15 years, yeah. Yeah, he's 15 years of age. And then um, Belshazzar had been given opportunities for knowing and doing the will of God. He had seen or banished from the society of men. He had seen the intellect in which the proud monarch gloried, taken away by the one who gave it. He had seen the king driven from his kingdom and made a companion of the beasts of the field. So from these passages, we can discern that maybe that Belshazzar had to be of an age to witness and have reason to consider mm -hmm. the implications of Nebuchadnezzar's banishment. This occurrence would have been about nine years before 
he became a co-ruling king at the age of 15, making him about six years old at the time of his grandfather's banishment. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm referring to. Okay. So we have here then would be the vision of uh, Daniel chapter 8, would be 557, 556. Okay, so, um, so when we have the first year of Belshazzar um, in Daniel chapter 7, so, um, so the way that I've sorted this out is that um, Daniel chapter 8, for instance, it's in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, and there's going to be 19 years if I remember correctly, until the, um, the decree, until Cyrus comes to the throne. So I'm pretty sure I have it in 556. Okay. You have 557 or 556. Um, and, and the question is, who does he share the throne with? Because remember, he's the second in command. Mm -hmm. he's, he's not the sole ruler of Babylon. And um, I know I have a, a chart with this. But um, yeah, so let me see if I can find it quickly. Anyway, you can go on. I'll try to find this. OK, so you're saying it would be 556 rather than 557? Yeah, that's what I had worked out before. Well, his first year then would be 558? Yeah. Okay. Because he's going to be sharing the throne with, um, I just can't remember the guy's names. Uh, Nurgle, Nurgle Palazzo or something? or. Um, yeah, Nergliser. And he starts reigning in 559. Uh, but that's you know, I guess the first year of his reign would be 558. Yeah, so they have evil Merodach reigning from 561 to 559. So they have him reigning here for two years. Um, now, I've never really spent a great deal of time trying to, to prove all of this because I, I never thought it was that important. But um, you definitely have evil Merodach. He's going to begin reigning in 561. He's going to reign all through 561 into 560, or maybe into 559. It's unclear from what I could discern. Um, it's just that I think they base this mostly on Ptolemy's canon. Mm -hmm. And and so part of the problem with his canon is he just gives the, the number of years they reign, not particularly the years, right, if I remember correctly. So it's it's kind of it, there's a little bit of wiggle room here or there. So so it, it probably good just to leave those years as they are, uncertain, right? Just see, because there there's a wiggle room one year either way. But okay, so the, thing that, the thing that's interesting about Shazam is the second in command, the second ruler in the kingdom. With Neraglisser, with Labas, Labasi Marduk, and also with Nabonidus. So he's always the second in command. He's never the king. He's always the second ruler in the kingdom. Okay. Which is kind of odd. But it just has to do with uh, uh, the politics of Babylon at that time. Okay, so Babylon actually besieges, uh, sorry, is besieged by Cyrus then um, about two years. And there's an Elamite statement, which I don't have, you have to sort of look at up to check out. But she, okay. I, I think she, she must mention that the siege is two years. Okay, so Cyrus is going to be begin this siege um, that's going to end in 539, you're saying? Mm-hmm, yes. Okay.
Are you checking out that reference? Yeah, I'm checking it out. Yeah, so February 8th, 1881. Um, so, yeah, she says. Um, Belshazzar was acquainted with the dealings of God with Nebuchadnezzar, but this knowledge had no effect upon his own course. He blindly clung to the worship of idols and gave himself up to sexual, sensual indulgence. It was not long before reverses came. He had been defeated in battle by Cyrus and for two years had been besieged in the city of Babylon. Within that seemingly impregnable fortress, with its massive walls and its gates of, gates of brass, protected by the Euphrates and supplied with provisions for a 20 year siege, the voluptuous monarch felt secure and passed his time in mirth and revelry. Um, now, uh, the way that I understand this history is that uh, this battle had been going on between Babylon and uh, Persia but I don't picture that the city was completely besieged for a period of two years. Like we don't have that in the Babylonian records. And in the year that Babylon falls, that year beginning on the first day of the first month with the Akitu festival in the spring, they're going to be transporting uh, these gods from all the different places in Babylon uh, to the capital. That's why this, feast that they have is worshiping these gods of gold and silver and 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 brass and wood and stone um because they've been gathering them the the entire year now it, it's also a little more complicated than that in the sense that cyrus it could be that cyrus isn't interfering with the religious aspects of babylon that he's allowing these uh idols to be brought to babylon because Cyrus is trying to make himself out as a hero after he conquers Babylon from a religious perspective. Uh, Nabonidus, who's officially the king of Babylon, he um, is involved in worship, like he's actually like a monk. And that's why Nebuchadnezzar is really, appears to be the one in charge, because Nabonidus is... Belshazzar, you mean? Um, what's that? Belshazzar is the one in charge, you mean? Yeah, Belshazzar. Yeah, what did I say? Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. So that's um, going to be, let me see here. Um, yeah, so Nabonidus is, is the king. He's a monk, but Belshazzar is the one in charge. Yeah, I shouldn't have said Nebuchadnezzar. Um, so in 539, so... So she says there's a siege of two years, but there's actually uh, Nebuchadnezzar's army gets involved in some other battles prior to coming to Babylon before he destroys it, before he conquers it. So. Cyrus, you mean? Yes, yeah, Cyrus. Okay, Cyrus. <laughs> I'm looking at all these names here. And I'm just getting okay, so Cyrus. So Cyrus is involved in these other battles over a period of two years, but he doesn't, he doesn't just set up a siege around like with his whole army around the city of Babylon for two years. But I don't think that's necessarily what she's referring to either. Um, there's some kind of a siege going on, right? Some kind of control that Cyrus has over the city of Babylon at that time. Yeah, I'll maybe look into that and uh, yeah. if that needs changed. Well, I don't think it needs to be changed. I just think that, you know, there's there's it's uh there's a lot to the story of what happens with the fall of Babylon. It's it's not just very simple. There's a lot of political things that were going on at that time. But we do have the record of what happened when Babylon fell um in in the babylonian chronicles okay. 
um, I think it's 20, 25, 12, right? Not time or, or reference for the 70 years for Babylon. So they come to the end in uh, 539. Mm -hmm. And coming uh, up my reference. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, so. It's actually Jeremiah twenty-five, eleven, and twelve. I would put there. Right. Okay. So we have evidence here for the actual. What's that? We have actual documented, documentable evidence for the exact um, day. It's the fifteenth day of uh, Sipar was seized without battle, Nabonidus yeah. fled. The 16th day of Gog, Rias, whatever. So, yeah, so it just, is, just mm -hmm. shows you that uh, the Nabonidus Chronicle gives us that mm -hmm. particular. Yeah, and if you read, yeah, and if you read in the Nabonidus Chronicle, it's going to go through the months leading up to the seventh month. And uh, so when it gets to, to the seventh month, Tishri to, which is Tishri, um, then it's gonna give those dates. So we know the exact date Babylon fell. Mm -hmm. So so Nebuch uh, or Cyrus's army were, were battling different places at that time as well, not just Babylon. So they take the city of Sippur and then they take Babylon the next day. Okay, thanks. Um, we have Daniel 11, verse 1. The angel Gabriel strengthens Darius. So we think that's likely applying to him being strengthened to take Babylon, even though it's kind of Cyrus. Um, and then we have Dan in the lion's den. I put in 538. Uh, it's hard to maybe pin down exactly, but I think this would be most likely because it would probably take a, a while before Darius is then exalted above the other 120 princes or whatever it is in the uh, Medo Persian realm. So we'll have probably be the year when Daniel's in the lion's den. And then after that, he has a prayer of chapter nine and he receives a 70 week prophecy. And um, I don't have it here, but I have it somewhere else that as through an Ellen White statement, that uh, this year prayer occurs after the lion's den. I think that's uh, or something that, that she refers concerning when she's commentating concerning this prayer of Daniel. She references it, that it wasn't, or there was something that was like the lion's den had happened before that. So. Okay, so so in the first year of Dryas, which we would probably mm -hmm. take spring, that that there's going to be the situation with Daniel being thrown in the lion's den, and then it's after that we have the prayer of Daniel chapter nine, where he gets the seventy weeks um, prophecy given to him. That's what you're saying. Yes. Okay, 537, we have uh, Darius, he then dies, and then Cyrus ascends the throne. And this uh, ends the 70-year Babylonian, Babylonian captivity. And there's an Elamite statement there. She says, the reign of Darius was honored of God. Upon his death, within two years of the fall of Babylon, Cyrus succeeded to the throne. And the beginning of his reign marked the completion of the 70 years since the first company of Hebrews had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar, 
from their Judean home to Babylon. But it's not near when uh, the actual decree uh, takes place for the, the captains to return. Uh, we understand in Daniel chapter 10, uh, he fasts between the fourth and, is it the 20, he ends his fast on the 24th day of the first month. Mm -hmm. So that would be in like around April time. And this is when he was praying uh, concerning the uh, captives for Cyrus. I, I believe he, he was praying for it so that Cyrus can actually uh, issue this year decree that there was a battle going on that uh, Satan wasn't was working with Cyrus trying to prevent him releasing the captives back to uh, Babylon. So Daniel prays and Michael comes in and uh, gives the victory for this year decree uh, to be made for the captives to return. So this is uh, Daniel's vision of chapters 10 to 12. And the, the exiles return to Jerusalem and build an altar. And that's, we find out in Ezra 2, verses 64 to 65. That tells us the number. The whole congregation together was 42,300 and uh, three score, 16. beside their servants and maids, of whom there were 7,337. And there were among them 200 singing men and women. So I'm, I'm not too sure how to, I shall count this. I'll actually just go down to the, uh, I wasn't sure whether he's here 200 singing women and men and women, or maybe part of this year, uh, 7337. Hmm. Not so odd. It says, and they were among them. So I was thinking, was that included? Or? That would be included, I think. Okay. I have to look at it a bit more closely the Hebrew here. But it seems like that's what it would be. So there were servants and maids, of whom there were 7,337. So that's 7,337. And there, and, and there were among them 200 singing men and women. So just a means of the, that number, 200 were singers. OK, so it might be then 6,697 six, then would be the actual total number. That's interesting. And uh, there's actually, um, I'm not included here, but there's another number you get from um, Nehemiah. The congregation, you have maybe like a 30, 30 something thousand, or I can't remember. Um, there's differences. I have to look into that. I, just, I was just looking at some commentary concerning it. But this year number I find interesting because uh, the geomatra, geomatria of Genesis 1-1 is uh, 37 times 73. So you have that sort of a number there, or you could have or 73 times 37 or whatever. So is uh, 2,701. And um, there's a lot of, there's a sort of interesting rare numbers you can get from that there, like uh, 73 is the 21st prime number and 37 is the 12th prime number. We have like a 21 and then a 12, so it's, it's quite similar. And um, 37 is the uh, 37th old number. 
or something. Like, there's all these connections between these two numbers. Oh. So, uh, and 535, the foundation of the temple is laid, and then some weep, some fight for joy. That's being built. In the second day of the second month. Okay, so yeah, whatever. Maybe add that. Yeah, because that's in. Um, uh, where is it here? Was it not uh, Solomon's Temple then? It was well, maybe it's Solomon's Temple that's the second day of the second month. Mm -hmm. That was March. I think this is March 15, isn't it? No, you're talking about the dedication of the temple? No. Did this... Well, sorry. Yes, okay. I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking 515. Yeah, and that's the 12th month. Um, yeah, so let me see here. Yeah, so it's Solomon's Temple that it's on the second day of the second month. And... Yeah, so this one here, because this is in, in the book of Ezra, and so that's going to be Ezra chapter 2, chapter, is it chapter 1? Ezra 3, I have the reference there. Yeah. 3, 8 to 13. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the second year they're coming out of the house. Unto the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month. Yeah, it's not the second day of the second month. It's the second year of the second month. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, for something I note about this here, the measurements, the temple. Um. Okay. Yeah. You're not told the length of the house, but it's uh, two sides of being 36,000 square cubits converted. Okay, so um, it's... So that would be um, converted to be 36... Sorry, 3,600 days. So 3,600 square cubits, I think, is with the dimensions that were given. Okay. So 3,600 days each side uh, would equate to... So, uh, so 3,600 days would equate to 10 years using a 360-day year, years. giving a total of 20 years. So this was about the length of the time when Zerubbabel laid its foundation stone uh, to its completion. So. Okay, so you're saying the 20 years from uh, 535 to 515. Yes. Okay. And so you're saying that the measurements are yeah, it gives you, I think it's like 60 by 60. Oh, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. Being one side, and then the other side would be 60 by 60. So just going by the measurements we're given, you would have two sides of 3,600. Converted to days would give you then 20 years. So that, in a sense, the measurements were given there symbolizes the actual period of 20 years it takes okay. for the temple to be built. So that's my suggestion. Can maybe add that to that. Okay. So then we have the 490 years with the Babylonian captivity being a result 
of the lamb not resting for 490 years from the anointing of Saul, which is 6 and 7. And uh, the Chronicles 36, 20 to 21. So they were carried away to Babylon uh, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath for as she lay for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. So you've you've covered that elsewhere. And then uh, 530 BC, Sarah dies and Cambyses stands up according to Daniel 11, verse 2. So mm -hmm. and then Ellen White, she says Cyrus reigns for seven years and uh, Cambyses, he reigns for three and a, sorry, seven and a half years. So how prophets and kings, I think that's probably that reference. Gives, mm -hmm. tells you that. And then 522, Cambyses dies in false murder reigns. And uh, he's killed by Darius the Great, who then reigns. And... Uh, the temple construction was stopped during the time of false murders. So we read that in uh, Ezra chapter four. Yeah, and and Darius kills false murders on the tenth day of the seventh month. Okay, so is that um, some chronicle tells you that? Yeah, um, I should get that reference. Um, it, it's it's a record that they have of it. Um, yeah, I need to find that. Anyway, yeah, so yeah, we'll put that in there as just a reference. Okay, and then second year of Darius, uh, Haggai and Zechariah begin to prophesy, and the work starts in the temple again. That's in five twenty BC. So, just another footnote there. I have concerning Daniel. So I reckon he dies when he's 88. Okay. So that's, uh, says, go thy way, Daniel. Till the end be, thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. So I'm saying I'll suggest Daniel dies soon after that vision. Okay. Not... Just a, just a suggestion. So 519, Zechariah's visions, chapters 1 to 6, or uh, one, sorry, chapter 1, verse 6 to uh, 7, verse, chapter 1, verse 7 to chapter 6. 518, there's uh, the fourth year of Darius. We have the rest of Zechariah's visions. And then 516, we have the degree of Darius. And the 70 years of Zechariah 1, verse 12, fulfilled of the temple's desolation. Well, this date completes 490 years from the dedication of Solomon's temple. And then the sixth year of Darius, the second temple is dedicated. This occurs on the third day of the 12th month. And the biblical calendar being March 12th in the Julian calendar in that year. Then we have Xerxes becomes king of Medo-Persia. So his accession year begins in the spring of, sorry, his first year begins in the spring of 5, 484, I can be right. Maybe I have something wrong there. Is it maybe 485? Yeah, I think it should be 485. Because mm -hmm. his first year begins in 484 is what I remember. 
Okay, so this is when we have It says 486 until 465. So I think, um, what's that footnote? Where did you, that's just your comment? Yeah, so that would be 484 would be his first year. Sorry, 485. And yeah, and 484, because in the book of Esther, um, chapter one, um, in the third year of his reign, that's going to be 483, right? So, so that would be 485 would be his first year? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then, so this is, he stands up, he'll be far richer than they all are, and through his riches, he shall stir up the realm of Grecia. So Xerxes sought the conquest of Greece after the divorce of Vashti and the marriage to Esther. Before the marriage of Esther, that should be. So we have here 43. We have the 180 day and seven day feasts, and Vashti is divorced. And then it's going to be three years later, then Esther's purification begins for 12 months. And then the seventh year of Xerxes, he takes Esther as his wife. And then uh, the 12th year, is when Pur is cast before Haman, the Agagite, and the death decree is published, and Esther calls a fast and goes before Xerxes, Haman is hanged, and a, a counter decree is issued. So uh, there's some things I've been looking at. I don't know if I was going to add it. So I don't think I've added it. We we'll have. Okay. So the first. Um, First number we actually get in the in the book of es Esther is one two seven. That's relating to the one hundred twenty seven provinces, yeah. and then the last number you have in the book is one hundred twenty seven. Okay, so that's the number then following the first one two seven is. That 180 day feast followed by the seven day feast. Yeah. And so the, the second last number you have in Esther, if you add up the numbers, you have these here 500 people being killed. Then you have your 10 sons of human being killed. And then there's like a 300 being killed. And then it talks about 75,000. Mm -hmm. So are the enemies of the Jews that are killed. So in total, uh, you have 75810. So it's it's almost like a, a mirror of that 180 day and seven day feast, except you have like a five in between. But if, if you add uh, to that number 1190, so maybe like a symbol of November nine. Okay. Uh, it takes you to seventy-seven thousand. And if you add twelve sixty, uh, it will take you to seventy-seven thousand seven and seventy. Okay. So you have like a seven-seven-seven symbol. If you add twelve sixty to it. So we had. The 18th of July being in, like in the center of a 777 day period. So you have that sort of connotation, and that 777 day period begins in November 9. So, 
So like a kind of handing of something, it's connecting mm -hmm. in some way. Um, and then uh, the book of Esther only mentions the third year, the seventh year, and the twelfth year of Xerxes. Mm -hmm. And uh, three times seven times twelve is two hundred fifty. Yeah. So we stumble to twenty five twenty there. And then you have. Following on then the twelfth year, the kinder degrees affected. Sons of Haman is killed. And the Purim feast instituted. And then uh, Xerxes is assassinated in six, 465, and Xerxes, or, or the Xerxes, sorry, becomes king. So there's no real reference there I have, but you can, you can just work back from uh, years of, that it gives you there, the seventh year of Arda Xerxes, when he takes to the throne. So we have here the, the 2,300 year and 70 week prophecy begin. And this goes into effect in the autumn of that year, Ellen White says. And then it's in the eighth year of Artaxerxes that the people of Judah confess their transgression due to the marrying of foreign wives. And the matter is examined and transgressors are separated from the congregation. So that's in 456 BC. So I think that's uh, like early because yeah, it happens sort of late in the eighth year, I think, or sorry, yeah. Um, there I mentioned there the nearly 20 years passed by. That's to do with Cyrus's decree and the building of the temple. So we're able to gauge um, concerning the 20 years for that building of the foundations, the temple. Completion. And then I noticed that from the flood, it's uh, 457 years to the. Um, so this is the end of the first prophecy of the Bible, 120 years. And then the second prophecy in the Bible that we've come across is the 400 years that we find in Genesis 15. Between them is 457 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second prophecy occurs in 1933 BC. So from the flood, it's 1933 years then to 457 BC and the decree of Artaxerxes. So, so you're, uh, you're putting the prophecy of the 400 years, that is Genesis chapter 15. You're placing that in 30 years after he leaves Haran, Haran? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have like a, a, a nice date span correlation. This is the first part. The prophecy it brings us to. Um, but isn't 1933? That's that's when Ishmael's winged. 1933 BC. That's going to be later. All right. Okay. So this is. Um, but this is where it actually begins. Oh, Sorry. it begins. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, that's. Uh, yes, it was given prior to that, but actually, yes. Okay, so you're looking at when the 400 years starts. Okay, mm -hmm. I see. Yeah, so the 400 years of affliction begins there. Okay, that makes sense now. So this is like just four, seven times of Leviticus 26. 
what we've uh, covered before. Uh, Manasseh, 70 years to uh, Reagan seven times. And then that takes you to seven years captivity. And then you've 70 times two, the Artaxerxes decree. And then uh, 70 years for the temple, four or seven times, giving a, a period of 220 years. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to detail that. Uh, no, we've gone over this many times. Yeah, so. Just to have it in the paper is good. And then we have 444 BC for the 20th year of Artaxerxes, where Nehemiah leaves Shushan. And we have the walls of Jerusalem are, are rebuilt in 52 days. Uh, so it's unfair if these 52 days include the three days of Nehemiah 2, verse 11. So it's 52 days from the crucifixion of Christ to the day of Pentecost with the three and 49 aspect. Mm -hmm. So it could well correlate with that. Mm -hmm. And Jeff took it as three days and 49 days to make mm -hmm. 52 days. Yes. So we have 432 BC for the 32nd year of Artaxerxes. And this is when Nehemiah attends the king and thereafter returns to Jerusalem. And then we have 408 BC. This date marks the end of the seven weeks of the 70 week prophecy. And we have no event for this year, other than it's just marking a, a jubilee cycle. Uh, uh, just a note there, just go back, um, whether it's significant or not. So um, you're going to have, um, from 457 BC to 444 BC, 13 years. And this is this period of 49 years, right? From 457 to 407. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have 13 years to the 20th year of Arctic Circus. And then 12 years to 432 BC. And then um, that's going to end up being, uh, let me see here, 13. 24. Yeah, 24 years. Mm -hmm. Is that what that is? Yeah, so yeah, from 32 is 24. So 24 years. So it's just, it's divided into uh, 13, 12, 24. And uh, Now, of course, um, if you multiply that together. Then divide it by two. Divide by two, you get 1872. Yeah. OK. So I just noticed that. You probably noticed that before, right? I didn't, but uh, I was thinking <laughs> about it when you brought it up. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so it's just an interesting division uh, of time. Mm -hmm. Period. It is, yes. Now, what I had always done before is I'd looked at the division of the 13 and the 36, and 13 times 36 is 68, and that's the number of years uh, from the destruction of the temple in 70 AD uh, to 538. 468 years. So that's how I had always looked at it before. It dealt with that span of time of 468 years. But we can see here that we just, we can break up that 36 into 12 and 24. And when we multiply that with the 13, we get two times 1872. So, so it's kind of interesting that we get these connections and how that 70, 
uh, seven weeks is divided in the Bible. Yes. So this is a new edition. I'd mentioned this during the last week. Mm -hmm. So um, Israel, he's aged 147 when he dies. Mm -hmm. and um, But just before he dies, he prophesies over his 12 sons. So it's 147 times 12, 1,764 years, which takes you to the end of literal Israel as a nation, as God's people. Yeah, and we and we already sort of have that that structure there, but you're now just make connecting it to the 147 times 12. Right? Yes. Because mm -hmm. that was the one that you and I found back in 2016. Okay. And then it's also seven times two fifty-two, by the way, just to remind people. That's right, yes. And 36 times 4. And um, Joseph, he's actually uh, 56. Okay. When uh, his father dies, now he, this would be then 31.5 times. 56? Yes. But if you're going to go to 1798, it's 63 times 56. Yeah. So it's like half of a one two six. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I notice here that uh, four oh eight BC mm -hmm. is uh, nine times one four seven, and then you have from four oh eight it's it's nine times forty nine. So you could have like this uh, bit of a Division there. Um, yeah, so the division there is just simply the number nine. So nine sabbatical or nine jubilee cycles and also nine cycles of 147 going to 408. 36 times 49, the whole period then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that section. Okay. So now we're probably that in for now, eh? Now, is that the end of your paper? That's not just that section eight. Oh, oh section so eight. Then, so then we go on to the um, Alexander the Great and so forth, that period. Okay. Okay. But yeah, we're we're at the hour and a half period of time so I okay, so we'll land there yeah so so the next period you have as section nine that's the last one no two more after that oh okay yeah you got section 10. okay so we still got it more weeks then <laughs> well section nine two more weeks at least well, it depends how we get on. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, any comments about any of this? I mean, it's me and Stephen kind of talking over numbers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if anybody's awake still. Come on, people are awake. It's a lot of information to take in, but a lot of it is review. There's a lot of it also that ties right into what we have been addressing and studying in the yeah. morning meetings and in other things that we're going to be going over. Right. So it's important because we know that chronology is the backbone of prophecy. If we're going to understand the prophecies, we need to get this. We need to see one is we can see through many different evidences that this chronology is correct that it creates structures and coincidences in quotation marks that definitely cannot be something we manufactured. 
it, it's not something that's obvious that you know that just but should, not to me anyway <laughs> but it didn't just happen obviously from what the history of the bible is that is these different structures tying events that are connected uh, with these different spans of times and dates so what's what Stephen has done with dates and and spans is something that's kind of unique that God gave him um, you know I, I do much more precise things regarding you know the cycles of the moon and the sun and, and different things but all these things come together to, to illustrate the same fact and that is that God has created in in history he has let history unfold in a way that is prophetic and especially bible history so um now we'll but try to follow that statement that says when uh false smirtus was killed on the day of atonement so i will try to find that but i just can't find it right now i know i have it somewhere yeah william you had a comment yeah i just was wondering uh you send an after notes yeah, so what we're going to do is, the, this is on my academia site. So if you go to my academia site, Theodore Turner at academia.edu, you'll find Stephen's paper. It's, it's in uh, um, not the first papers, but it's in the drafts. And, and once we get the final updated paper, then we'll send it out again to everyone. So that you'll okay. have, I, I think part of it is I didn't want... You know, because the paper is kind of incomplete, I put it on my academia site uh, to sort of have people look at it. You know, once we get the paper updated, then everybody can have a good copy of it. Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, so I'll try to find that statement about uh, Darius uh, when he kills false Smyrtus, because uh, it's it's rather interesting uh, the document. And it's always dismissed, you know, scholars always dismiss things when they don't fit in with their ideas, even though we have a, a plain document stating when it occurs, uh, you, you generally won't see that as uh, accepted, but I'm never sure why. Just it, it doesn't fit in with some of their other ideas. It steps on somebody's toes, I guess, but okay. Well, thanks, Stephen. Appreciate all that. Thank you for going through it with me and identifying just some things that I need to change and add to it and so forth. Um, Kate, so do you want to close with prayer or do you want me to? Uh, could you close for me, please? Uh. Dear Father in heaven, we are so very thankful for the Sabbath, the blessings of fellowship. And we know, Lord, that there's just so much that you want to show us of your love and your compassion, of your character, of your order, of your foreseeing all the events of history, including the events of our lives, and that you care for each one of us. And we are thankful, Lord, that you have made each of us different and you have allowed and entrusted us with various truths. We know, Lord, that we need to study together. And we pray for this movement, that um, this can occur, that the rifts that exist will be healed, and that we can come together in the upper room and receive the light and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that you have promised. Be with each one. Bring us together again tomorrow morning, according to thy will. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.